Dear Father in heaven, thank you for our blessings. Thank you, Lord, for the fellowship we can have even so far apart, but we are close Lord, in, in spirit, I pray that you will bless our fellowship as we can study together, as even at this distance we can look at, at how you have led your people in the past and how you are leading us now. I pray, Lord, that you will uh, give us wisdom and, and courage as we study these things, as many of them we find um, quite challenging in our own uh, particular ways that we will I'll be able to have a correct interpretation at the end times. I put all these things into your hands and pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So I, I don't want to get too far off course from what we've been studying uh, because I, I know that there was a, a discussion this morning uh, in Brother Brendan's c class about vaccines. So you, you're probably already aware that some of the... Uh, the, the direction that I'm heading in uh, will include a discussion of conspiracy theories, uh, in, including these particular topics. And when you consider uh, how the United States began in 1798, the way that we have these two political factions, um, the way one of these political factions is supported by the evangelical right, um, the way that evangelical right is going to weaponize conspiracy theories um, to, to bring about that, um, to, to, to try and bring about their political end, um, including the enforcement of, of Protestant morality, uh, just one aspect of which is Sunday laws. You can see that we already have conspiracy theories baked into our bread, if, if we could put it that way, uh, of today's topic. Um, so I, I do want to bring it around to conspiracy theories. It wasn't my intention to mention vaccines, but I will try and include some, some of these things as we discuss conspiracy theories, because I know that for each one of us, a different conspiracy theory can, can probably uh, be, be much more, we're much more prone to follow. So for some people it might not be vaccinations. There might be, be another conspiracy theory that can, can um, be really challenging for us. Many, for many people it's 9-11. Uh, for many people it's climate change. And, and I want everyone to, just to be aware the reason that I can speak with a, a degree of knowledge about these conspiracy theories is particularly because I used to believe all of them. You know, I, I'm not quite as as young as some people might tend to think, but I was first vaccinated last year. And for, uh, certainly climate change, grew up not believing in climate change because of books that I'd read. Um, and many other things, 9-11, Walter Weith, I was, I was neck deep in all of that. So we've all come from something, and, and this is conspiracy theories are a major part of Adventism, conservative Adventism. And what I'm trying to demonstrate is why it's such a major part of Adventism and where these conspiracy theories, um, the, the most dangerous of them, can lead us to. So it's not that anyone is foolish for believing in conspiracy theories. Otherwise, this whole movement's in trouble because none of us would have any idea uh, uh, how to talk about anything. But we're, we've all come from Adventism. It's baked into Adventism. And we need to start thinking about why that is. So I did in, uh, in the break, I did find a couple of articles about, um, about not just vaccinations, but they actually, it's particularly targeting that subject. But th there's just a few articles that will actually give some of the um, reasons behind conspiracy theories. It's actually quite a, 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 an interesting study about what composes these theories, why they become so easy to believe. It's not that people are crazy, that there's actually a, a type of methodology behind it that's quite captivating. So uh, I'm hoping that everyone has joined the media broadcast groups that have been created, and I'll try and have some of those articles put on the media broadcast group um, so, so that it, it, uh, it can be accessible, and we might mention a couple today. So I've already began, I'm sorry for Zoom. Um, with Zoom you may have difficulty. 
you may have difficulty on Zoom now, um, seeing the details of the writing. I know that it's a bit far away. We are prioritising the recordings because that is what will go online. Um, so I'm sorry if it's hard to see. And I can see there's a couple of sunspots. So I think if you have a picture of what we've been doing on the board in the last couple of weeks, what is written up is essentially that, um, just more condensed. So you have ancient and modern Israel. We've just overlaid them. There's a quote in the Great Controversy, Great Controversy 457.2. And it's just interesting in, in this Great Controversy quote, all that Ellen White is saying is that the history of ancient Israel is a striking illustration of the past experience of the Adventist body. And then she goes into how the Hebrews were brought out of Egypt, uh, their disappointment, uh, the Red Sea, their need to trust in the guiding hand of God despite these disappointments. All that she's doing is taking this history of ancient Israel as they come out of Egypt and she says that's a striking illustration of the past experience of the Adventist body. So she's here in the 1888 history writing the Great Controversy and she's saying that this, that this coming out of Egypt is a striking illustration of Adventist past experience. So she's going back to this Millerite time period, the disappointment, the coming out of apostate Protestantism. It's just a neat quote to show her also recognise this um, compare and contrast. And then in this great controversy quote, again written in this 1888 history, she says, if all who had laboured unitedly in the work in 1844 had received the third angel's message and proclaimed it in the power of the Holy Spirit, the Lord would have wrought mightily with their efforts. A flood of light would have been shed upon the world years ago. Years before 1888, the inhabitants of the earth would have been warned, the closing work completed, and Christ would have come for the redemption of his people. So this is another quote to reinforce what we've been saying, that Christ could have, should have returned prior to uh, the 1888 history. So as we compared and contrasted, we saw ancient Israel, modern Israel. You had darkness, captivity, and a loss of the Sabbath in the captivity in Egypt in those 400 years. You had the exact same experience in the 1260 years, the loss of the Sabbath, the darkness, the captivity. Ancient Israel is brought out of Egypt. A deliverer, Moses, leads them out. Miller led out a, 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 a denominated people. You had uh, ancient Israel led out of pagan nations. Modern Israel was led out of Protestant churches. This is showing how there is both a compare, but there's also the contrast. And the contrast is now you have a separation of church and state. So ancient Israel out of pagan nations, modern Israel out of Protestant churches. This is all part of that contrast that we discussed last week, the all-important contrast. The, after they leave Egypt, after 1844, the Sabbath is re-brought uh, re, um, before to God's people again. Um, God, God is gentle with how he, he leads us. We accept one truth after another. You see that in this movement. You see that back then. But in this time period, he says it's time for them to be required to keep the seventh day Sabbath. And then you have the prophet given. Moses here, he, he wrote um, their, uh, their law. And here we have Ellen White who becomes a, the prophet for modern Israel. You have a, a, a going back into the condition of Egypt, that Apis bull experience, the asking for a king, um, the, this apostasy this idolatry that they should have left behind in Egypt. In 1850, we also have the later scene condition, um, this losing of our message of time, etc. It was the condition of Protestantism we were meant to leave behind. Uh, this experience in Babylon, they could have come out of Babylon ready to do the work. 1888, same thing. Work should have, could have been completed. But... Again, it was a failure on the part of God's people. 
the final history, the Omega history, Rome, and the history of the 144,000. And this is the history of success. It's when ancient Israel, in whatever damaged fashion, however much they weren't equipped as a nation to take part in that work, the work was completed by a remnant. So I wanted to ask, what three things did, did God's people of ancient Israel have wrong in this history? So we've discussed part of that. What they had wrong, which caused them to reject Christ, is they were wrong about the kingdom, sorry, the king, the kingdom, and the external events. So they were wrong about the king, they were wrong about the kingdom, but they were also wrong about the external events. The reason they were wrong about the external events is you can't misunderstand the nature of the kingdom and then have a correct understanding of the external events that relate to that kingdom. So they expected the overthrow of Rome. What they didn't expect is the destruction of Jerusalem. This relates to, to and again this is an interesting contrast, when you come back to that history, they don't understand the events that, re that relate to ancient Israel, they also don't understand the events that relate to the end of the glorious land. So they misunderstand the experience of ancient Israel. They also misunderstand the events relating to the glorious land. And the glorious land is where today? It's the United States. So we, Adventism, in the same condition as ancient Israel, there's three areas of error. Don't understand the nature of the king, don't understand the nature of the kingdom, and also the external events that relate to modern Israel, God's final um, denominated people, Seventh-day Adventism, that also don't understand correctly the external events that relate to the glorious land and what's going to happen to the glorious land, which is today the United States of America. So we have those two parts because we have to separate the, the glorious land um, because Seventh-day Adventism is not a theocracy. Uh, it's just part of that contrast. So that's three areas that ancient Israel, Israel was wrong and that is also uh, directly relates to the mistakes modern Israel is going through. Then we came to, um, the, we spoke about the cure. The cure for these wrongs was parable teaching. It was Christ's parables. Coming to modern Israel, I, I have just to remind what's been said before, we compare and contrast ancient with modern, but we can also compare and contrast our alpha and omega histories. Our beginning will teach us of our end. So that's why we spent so much time on 1798. You have this um, split within Protestantism that all particularly became evident when you have this time period of revival. So the first great awakening, we're beginning the second great awakening. Um, there's this split between liberal and conservative. It's been split particularly about how they relate to external events, how they both view the, um, the American Revolution, the forming of the Republic, the nature of the Constitution, America as a secular or a Christian nation, the French Revolution, etc. So depending on how they view external events, um, would sp help split them, Protestantism, into these two branches. I don't want to discuss the liberal branch too much because I don't think they have that much to teach us. It's the conservative branch that particularly uh, we can trace through this history. I want to be specific. We talk about the Pharisees, how they were into reforms, um, all of that, but there's a danger that people misunderstand the terms liberal and conservative. I want to be more specific today. When I'm talking about liberal and conservative, if you were to look at the United States right now and you were to go to two news sources, Fox News and MSNBC, 
If you were to look at those two news sources, Fox, MSNBC, and you were to look at their female hosts, which one looks more modest? MSNBC, the liberal branch. If you were to go and watch Rachel Maddow, she may have short hair, but she looks less provocative than the bleached blonde, short skirt Fox News female hosts. So if you're going to make this about reforms, then it's really going to start to take us away from what I've meant from the very beginning about liberal and conservative. I'm talking about social liberalism and social conservatism. You'll find lesbian Rachel Maddow presenting for MSNBC and she's in a neat suit, doesn't have to show much skin, doesn't have to wear a lot of makeup, um, doesn't have to dye her hair. It's Fox News that has to, to create that image. Uh, it, even when you do see on both sides, at the very least, they're, they're equally, um, they might be equally into, into those things. They're wearing makeup. The men are wearing makeup on Fox and on MSNBC. When I'm talking about liberal and conservative, I'm specifically talking about socially liberal and conservative, social issues. So this socially conservative branch of Protestantism, there's some things that particularly characterise them. In 1798, there was the first, I think it might have been the first, at least two, two of the three, uh, if not all three, I think there was about two. Th so in 1798 and then in 1799, combined the two years, there were three widely publicised sermons by the Reverend Jedediah Morse disclosing a dark conspiracy, a dark conspiracy involving both domestic critics of the uh, John Adams uh, presidential administration and a mysterious order of European anarchists known as the Bavarian Illuminati. By framing his suspicions in the form of a Jeremiad, Jeremiah is like the book of Jeremiah. It's a, it's a long, woeful talk about, um, it's a bitter lament about society's ills and immoralities. Because he's framed his sermons in that way, what Jedediah Morse was he portrayed this Illuminati conspiracy as a divine test for the United States. As a result, the conspiracy provided a rhetorical justification for the condemnation of po domestic political dissent on moral grounds. So what he's doing is he's justifying the, the condemnation of, of any dissent against the John Adams administration. It's exactly what we see happening in Trump's America today. You can't speak against Trump's America because it's been framed as the conspiracy theories about the deep state in America has been framed as a divine test for the um, American civic piety. So we discussed this, it's that this characterizes them, the deep state. And when I see deep state, it's not today like they're saying, it's all those Democrats. It's the Democrats and it's also disloyal Republicans. And they have different words for those. Um, within the Republican Party, but it covers, it co crosses party lines. It's a deep state that's particularly one side, but is also everyone within one's own party that is not loyal. So we discussed the, the other side, the other political party was Thomas Jefferson, but then you also had Hamilton. Hamilton is in the same political party as John Adams, but he's not loyal to John Adams. So both both men were brought into this conspiracy theory, it crossed party lines. That's what makes it this, this evil deep state. Doesn't matter what party you belong to, they're part of the Illuminati and they all have a satanic agenda. Again, the, the, this idea that this deep state is controlled by Satan is directly satanic. Also characterised by their belief that America was formed as a Christian nation built on Christian moral principles. The combination of church and state, they believe in that combination of church and state, even though they might phrase it differently. Uh, if I could refer to uh, one 
of uh, Ralph uh, Drolling, Drollinger, Drollinger, one of Trump's favourite um, pastors, serves in his administration. To quote him, Ralph Drollinger, he says, the institutional separation of church and state does not imply an influential separation of church and state. So he's saying the separation of church and state just means they're institutionally separated, church and state. But that does not imply influential separation. The church should influence the state. So they use this logic to justify the fact that they say, no, we believe in separation of church and state, but they're referring to an institutional separation. They believe in an influential union. That is what Jedediah Morse believed in, this combination of church and state. And it all uh, stems from a literal to literal interpretation of Bible teaching. So literal to literal, ancient Israel, theocracy, modern Israel, theocracy. Ancient Israel, the, the morality of the nation uh, defined its success as a political nation. Uh, you couldn't break the Sabbath in ancient Israel without the law um, punishing you. Modern Israel, as they see the United States, glorious land, you shouldn't be able to break Sunday without the law punishing you. You shouldn't be able to, to um, be, uh, you, you shouldn't, there should be no infidelity. No immorality, no homosexuality, nothing that they see as an attack on Christian values. So this is why Jedediah Morse was saying in 1798 that morality, Christian morality, needed to be enforced by law. So you find that at the very beginning. And remember, the United States, if we follow our rules of parable teaching, it will end the way it began. So he believes in the enforcement of morality. Literal to literal will teach you that. They believe in slavery. Literal to literal will teach you that. They believe in Sunday laws. Literal to literal will teach you that. So it's been this one thread, this conservative thread, socially conservative Protestantism that's gone through this whole period of the last... 200, 300 years um, from the forming of America with this mindset about, um, about this literal to literal interpretation and that's why they keep coming back to these same things. As we come to our time period we could discuss segregation and we've done that. How they responded to the civil rights movement because if you go to ancient Israel you have a separation of the races. It, it's it's put in, in the law. So at each point they're using this same methodology. So when we overlaid ancient Israel, modern, uh, sorry, the beginning of modern Israel and the end of modern Israel, we saw that it was all framed around recent events. Uh, uh, the beginning of modern Israel, you had the abolishing of the Jesuits in 1773, the American Revolution, Declaration of Independence, the Constitution and forming of a Republic, the French Revolution, the ending of papal power in 1798. All these external events are, are creating an interest in Protestantism about Daniel and Revelation. 1989, in the lead up to our time of the end, you had the same thing. There was the Cold War, the revolutions in Latin America, the Iran Revolution, the Afghanistan War, Israel, which had been restored and in 1967 had regained control of Jerusalem. We discussed those external events and how that created an interest in Protestantism of the books of Daniel and Revelation in the few decades leading up to 1989, particularly the last, uh, that, that 20 year time period. We quoted at length from an article, um, The Atlantic. So I just want to refer us back to a couple of those references. After the rapture, a seven year period of tribulation would fall on those left behind. So there's some obvious things we disagree with that Adventism and Protestantism would disagree over. The rapture is one of them. But they believe that that time period would begin with the appearance of an antichrist as leader of a ten nation confederation. 
He will seem to be a man of peace and will side with Israel when it is threatened by a northern coalition, which is now generally expected to be led by Russia, include Eastern Germany, the Arabs and Iran. Realisation that the raptured saints, the faithful who were caught up, had been prudent to believe in Jesus will cause 144,000 Jews and a multitude of Gentiles to accept him as the Saviour and Messiah. These converts, together with two outstanding prophets, possibly Moses and Elijah brought back to life, will win others to Christ. Unfortunately, these new Christians will be marked for persecution by the Antichrist, who by this time will have begun to show his true colours. He seems very benevolent at the beginning. The Antichrist will seek total control over humanity by requiring that every person wear a mark or a number, probably 666, the designated mark of the beast, in order to buy or sell. Those who refuse to accept this mark of the beast will be slain or will risk starvation because they cannot buy or sell. Those who accept it will burn in hell. At about this point, the Antichrist will be joined by the false prophet, a religious leader associated with Babylon a city called the Mother of Harlots and often identified in prophetic circles as the Pope of Rome. We took this and we went in to discuss Mary Stuart Ralph who began uh, particularly writing 1980, about 1981. Two, two of her most famous writings, a book When Your Money Fails, another book The 666 System. I don't think they're any longer in print. I tried to see, find one of them on Amazon and it was well over $1,000. So I'm guessing they, they might be collectors now. But we do have uh, in this article from 1982, it's ex explaining her logic. She has, so she'd come up to, to, to speak at the podium and she'd have dozens of documents and photographs to back her claims. She would show you all these different companies from all over the world, from Caterpillar tractors um, made in the US to shirts made in communist China to, to, um, to, to things made in Germany, all that they have this computer program, uh, all that they have 666 on their product code. Then she'll go to other companies and show in their computer programs they'll have 666 as a prefix. She'll take you to uh, documents by the World Bank, the IRS, Medicaid, Selective Service. She'll show you uh, Anwar Sadat, then the President of Egypt, reopening the Suez Canal to commercial navigation and his warship with 666 allegedly emblazoned across its bow. President Carter, he had tanks built that were stamped with 666. Not a surprise, they didn't like President Carter. He was a little uh, liberal, socially liberal. As were metric rulers widely distributed in the US during 1979. So she's just going to take all of these different examples and what she's saying is, can you see? Can you see all of these things? Can they really be a coincidence? She's saying that they're evidence for a satanic deep state, a deep state led by Satan, which is why you would have the use of the 666. And all of these companies, they're part of this secret society that in the background, they're all linked. And you only know they're linked by seeing these secret subtle messages that they'll send out to each other to say, we're part of this system. We're part of this deep state. I want to think about the methodology behind this type of, um, these types of conclusions that Mary Stuart Ralph was coming to. And I want to look at this in really two different ways, two different uh, parts of this methodology. And this first one, I really don't want to have misunderstood. The first one is ignorance. Ignorance is a major part of this methodology that's being used. Now we're all ignorant about something. Ignorance is just, it's impossible to avoid. Um, in fact, most things, most things we're actually ignorant about. I think the, the more readily we can acknowledge that, the easier it gets to not see this as actually something ugly. We are ignorant about many things. I want to use an example. 
Ben Carson. Most, I think most of us know who Ben Carson is. He's the Adventist who became part of Trump's administration. He's Seventh-day Adventist. He's a brilliant neurosurgeon. Uh, and then he joined Trump's administration in charge of housing in the United States. Ben Carson is brilliant as a brain surgeon. But what then he then began to believe was that he had the answer to, say, to solve the economic problems and the, def uh, the, the deficit of the United States. So he's brilliant as a brain surgeon, but if I read his books years ago, and in his books he made the argument that if only economists and politicians would listen to him, he was adamant he could fix the entire economy of the United States. He had this brilliant plan. So you'd have to believe that every other economist, everyone who's studied for decades, who's part of that system, who knows how the economy operates, that somehow that he has expertise that they don't have. Now that he's part of the Trump administration, you don't see him solving the economy. Even now, no one's listening to him and there's no evidence that he's now even promoting his views that were apparently the answer to fix the entire economy of the United States. So we're all ignorant about something. Ben Carson is brilliant as a neurosurgeon, ignorant about the, the, the American economy. And if he could acknowledge that, it would save... I, I think it would save a great deal of people a lot of pain. He's a brilliant neurosurgeon. How is he handling the housing crisis in the United States? Very, very badly, very poorly. So we're all ignorant about something, even if we're brilliant in particular areas. And when we can acknowledge that, then we can... Um, it, it can solve a lot of problems. I believe that this is part of the problem with Walter Weiss. He might be brilliant in, in areas of science, but then when that, that intelligence, that knowledge does not correlate to another area, to, to another territory. For example, nothing that he understands about the making up of an atom is going to help him better understand the, the cause and need for the United Nations. And many brilliant people create problems in the world when they believe that they then are uh, equipped to, to give their expert advice in areas that are outside of their field of expertise. I want to give some examples of how ignorance impacts conspiracy theories. So I watched a documentary. Um, I, I'm going to talk about myself when I do this because these are things I used to believe in. So I'm going to talk about the death of Princess Diana. I watched a documentary about her death and they were making, it was, a, it was made by conspiracy theorists. They were arguing that she was murdered, that her death was intentional. And I watched that documentary and I thought it makes sense to me. What they're saying makes sense. So I, I believed that she was murdered. I want to give you one of the reasons they gave for their conclusion. Princess Diana was in a car accident. An ambulance attended the scene they picked her up from that accident zone they had to take her three miles to a hospital so they had three miles to travel to take her from where she was uh, critically injured in that accident to get her to hospital and these three miles took them 1.1 hours. So it took them over an hour in an ambulance with flashing lights with no traffic to travel three miles. So the argument that, is, that they make in this documentary is why is it This is a favourite phrase. Why is it? And if you're like me, and you've listened to enough Walt Device, I hear that phrase in his accent. I hear it in his voice. I hear him say, why is it? I won't try and mimic it. 
But that's the first thing they're going to take you to. Take you to this thing that's really hard to explain and then say, why is it that it took 1.1 hours in an ambulance with flashing lights and no traffic to travel three miles? The next phrase you'll hear. Could it be that's going to be phrased as a question it's really hard to get Walter Weith to actually say anything concrete because he'll phrase it as a question. He'll lead you to the conclusion that he wants to lead you to, but he won't tell you that conclusion. It has to be phrased as a question. Why is it that Princess Diana took 1.1 hours to travel three miles to a hospital when she's dying? Could it be that there was a plot, deep state plot, to bring about her death, to allow her to die. It looks like a really neat conclusion. I don't have to say there was a deep state plot. People wanted her killed. People killed her. This was intentional. I don't have to say anything like that. And you won't hear other people say anything like that. Walter Weith will very rarely say something like that. It has to say, why is it? Bring a question to your mind that seems strange that seems like it's something you don't understand and then just ask could it be so I watched this documentary they made this argument but then later I found out this other piece of information the medical system in the United States works very different to the medical system in France so in the United States the way their ambulances operate when they attend an accident is if I had an accident here and I was 30 minutes from a hospital the, the, the way they operate in the United States is they get an ambulance here they put me in that ambulance and then they're going to get me to a hospital as fast as they can that's their number one objective is to get me to hospital so if I am dying in the ambulance if there's all, any kinds of problems then they will, the, their number one objective is ju just to get me to that hospital as quickly as they can. They don't run by that system in France. In France, what they have is a, what they call a scoop, a, a, a stay and play. So there's two different ways of operating with an ambulance. There's what is called scoop and run. versus stay and play and they're just short little phrases that were created to show people the different ways that, that, that the medical system operates so in the United States it's scoop and run get you in an, in, in an, in an ambulance and rush you to hospital in France no they have ambulances equipped that if you are dying that the objective is not to get you to hospital the objective is to treat you in the ambulance that means pulling over that means getting all the medical staff in the back of an ambulance putting in whatever drips they need to put in doing whatever they need to do and the back of that ambulance becomes the hospital bed and the emergency room so it's a difference between how the medical system operates in the United States and in many other countries compared to how they operate in France and because this is how ambulances operate in France in France it's completely normal that it would take 1.1 hours to travel three miles when they're treating her in the back of the ambulance which would require them to go slow or to pull over so that they can perform certain tasks so again this is something that can you can say why is it could it be someone who doesn't know this information, who's ignorant on the medical system, like I was, in some degree still am, would see this evidence of a conspiracy. But when you have information, you see that this could it be is actually not sustained by any type of fact. Another one, climate change. You'll see this argument made. If I have a glass of water, and in this glass, I put ice cubes and then I put some water in this cup 
let's say I put the water to here, ice is water that as it has cooled, it actually solidifies, but it also expands. So ice has more, uh, more of a circumference, it takes up more space than water. So as this ice melted in my cup, even though some of it is showing, you could calculate that the water level, if all of this ice melted, would actually go down, not up. So if this ice melted, the, the water level goes down because this ice, as, as it uh, warms and it shrinks, is going to take up less space. People use this argument to say that the polar ice caps, if the polar ice caps are melting, then all of that ice, which is expanded water, is going to make the ocean go up or go down? Go down. Because that ice is water that has expanded. And even though some of it is showing, if you can picture, I think we, we all have the idea in our minds about the iceberg. A little bit of it's showing, a great deal of it is underwater. So if you're to take this to an iceberg, the water is across here, but the iceberg is huge underneath. If this iceberg melted, would it cause water to go up or down? Down. Because the water, the, 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 uh, it, it's, it's expanded as it's frozen. So when we talk about rising sea levels, people will argue you can't have rising sea levels. In fact, if all of the ice melted on those ice caps, the water level is going to go down. You should have lowering sea levels, not rising sea levels. So again, I heard that argument. I actually heard that from a scientist. And it seemed logical. So I did not believe in climate change until I heard another. It just, it just took one sentence to, to, to know that my entire model was gone. Just one sentence. And that was by another scientist who said, isn't one of the polar ice caps on land? So that's fine, but mo most of this world's ice, much of it, is, is, is where? Now you have all of this ice sitting on top of a land mass. And now we're in trouble. And it's not just on top of that land mass. This is, if you, if you see this globally, you can see that even though you have some ice that would melt, like these icebergs as they melted and the sea level would go down, that would be counteracted, counteracted and then eclipsed by the amount of ice that is actually sitting on top of a land mass. So again, you could go to this and say, why is it that scientists, why is it that scientists aren't telling you about the fact that the ice going down would sh shrink um, water levels. And you'll see on YouTube, conspiracy theorists take a glass of water and demonstrate how w sea levels should shrink. And then I saw another video with another scientist and he had a glass of water with ice in it and then he just emptied an entire bucket of ice onto the glass and it was, it was I, I suppose, a, a humorous way of making his point. But you could say, why is it they won't tell you that ice expands, is expanded water? Could it be that there's some type of conspiracy theory within the scientific establishment to bring about a political agenda? And again, this is just one example of an argument they used that is based on ignorance and uses people's uh, ignorance against them. I don't want people to become offended when I say ignorance. It's just a fact that all of us are ignorant about some things, if not most things. That's why we research and look for answers. The other reason behind these conspiracy theories is another, it's actually a, a mathematical theory. Uh, again, I'm more ignorant about mathematics than I would like. So I'm not going to go into all the explanations of this theory, um, but I will have some links to, to a discussion about it um, placed on the media broadcast. It's called the Ramsey theory. And I'd rather 
just read from a news article, I'll just discuss this very briefly, what this Ramsey theory is. And they can see that this, um, this one is from Science Alert. It's a news article by Science Alert called... Uh, it's going to link to a, a, TED, a, a TED Ed, TED Education talk, um, titled The Origin of Countless Conspiracy Theories. This mathematical principle makes us believe in crazy conspiracy theories. There's no denying that humans are incredible creatures, putting a rover on Mars, detecting gravitational waves, finding the Higgs boson. But then there's one peculiar behaviour persists, and that is our belief in the strangest conspiracy theories. What's even stranger than us needing anything, something, anything to believe in is that we pretty much can't avoid it. We humans love to find order in chaos. And I believe that God made us that way. We're designed to see patterns. That's why when we look up at the clouds, we start wanting to know what shape they're making and what they look like. Humans love to find order in chaos. And from finding, trying to find order in chaos, we get Helman Merv Melville, the, the soothsayer, the faked moon landing, climate change denial. As this video will point out that it links to this TED Ed talk, if you got the entire text of Herman Melville's Moby Dick and arranged the entire text of that book into a rectangle, you'll find within that now, now um, brought together letters, as you squished it into a rectangle, you would find the prediction about the Martin Luther King assassination and the death of Princess Diana. Weird? Right? Well, not really, because in a world of random chaos, we humans rely on order, and our brains will do whatever it takes to find that order, whether it's finding word patterns in a mess of letters or familiar shapes in the constellations above us. That's why you have that game, what's it called, when they have random letters and you have to try and find the word. We're built to do that. We're built to try and find order in chaos. This is all explained by a mathematical principle called Ramsey theory. It's named after a British mathematician and philosopher, Frank P. Ramsey. Ramsey theory states that given enough elements in a set or structure, some particular interesting pattern among them is guaranteed to emerge. So he shows how even just with a small group you will almost inevitably, really inevitably, find some pattern. One example they usually give to demonstrate this is if you have some people at a party. Imagine you're at a party with six other guests without knowing anything at all about these people. It's a mathematical inevitability that some group of three of those people either all know each other or at this party have never met before based on the number of possibilities that can be applied to the group. But the mathematical equation it takes to figure this out with just six people gets out of control the moment you start adding more and more people in because the number of possibilities becomes overwhelming even for as few as 40 or 50 people. Seriously, if you wanted to use this equation to find a group of five people in a party of 48 who either all know each other or have never met, you'd end up with more possibilities than there are atoms in the universe. That's how prone we are to, to seeing the formation of patterns, even within a, a small group. It's a mathematical inevitability that the skies, stars in our sky are arranged in familiar shapes and the letters in a novel appear to conceal a prophecy. And we humans have been conditioned to find them. But just as maths makes conspiracy theories an inevitability, so too does it render even the most persistent ones impossible. You can read more about it, but let's just say that the suppression of a cancer cure would have been leaked by someone inside Big Pharma in just 3.2 years. So 
mathematically they can show you how prone and easy it is for us to, to locate conspiracy theories because in any even a small group set of data you are inevitably going to find patterns and if I can say so, if you have a nice big group of data, let's say dates, and you're going to expand that group of data on dates to include all types of numbering systems and a dozen different cal calendars, it, it doesn't become so strange to suddenly decide that there's going to be a nuclear attack on Nashville on July 18 because you've taken a huge set of data and with no rules, with no uh, principles of parable teaching just look for an abstract pattern that has no meaning behind it. This is the type of methodology that's being used by consp it, it was used by Mary Stuart Ralph back in the 1980s. It wasn't new. It was used in 1798 by Jedediah Morse. It continues through Protestantism. It continues through Adventism. It continues through Walter of Eith. It continues through those who left this movement and um, and have held on to their conspiracy theories and it, it's now their dominant methodology. So what has separated us? So all of this also comes back to our discussion on vaccines. A physicist calculated the prob probability that four widely believed conspiracy theories could have lasted this long without being uncovered. And mathematically speaking, it's not looking good for moon landing deniers or anti-vaxxers. The 2016 study revealed that for an old-fashioned cover-up to stay under wraps for 10 years, fewer than 1,000 people would need to be involved. To remain secret for a century, the number of people aware would need to be below 125. Considering that the most popular conspiracy theories would realistically involve thousands of people, the odds aren't great. My results suggest that any conspiracy with over a few hundred people rapidly collapses and big science conspiracies would not be sustainable. When we start talking about vaccines, we're using the same thing. This, why is it? You could expand on that. You, you could write it a, a little bit more, um, a little bit more carefully and talk about correlation equaling causation. So I'm going to have posted in the media broadcast an article by The Atlantic that's titled Correlation, Causation and Vaccination. Why is it that, that um, people can see little children develop um, develop these illnesses, uh, particularly the one we were discussing, uh, the autism, how can you see a, a three-year-old develop autism and bring it back to vaccination? And the reason is usually that what is happening is we're saying correlation equals causation and that is not a, a good principle to work off. Um, you know, I, I know many children who are healthy who were um, show no signs until three years old and they start having seizures. Children reach a de developmental age where those things actually start to be demonstrated. And because parents are looking for a reason, why did my child just have a seizure? They're going to start looking for a cause. So some parents will say, well, she fell and hit her head and then the next week she, she had a seizure. And while it may seem that the fall caused the seizure, there's no evidence for that. The this um, correlation, the fact that these two things occurred within a similar set of time, does not equal causation. It doesn't mean that one caused the other. But whenever you have something traumatic occur, and there's, uh, I know that there's, there can be a great deal of emotion, uh, painful emotion in this argument, we, it's usually because people are trying to find an answer to something they don't understand. So they're going to go back to this why is it argument and go correlation equals causation. But to not get sidetracked on the subject of vaccines, I'm going to uh, have some of those articles put in, in that group. So I want us to have a little look at just one quote of Walter Weiss. If we can see... 
if we can see what has been done here, um, that, that these two parts of, um, of what can build a conspiracy theory. First, ignorance. Why is it? Could it be? Second, the Ramsey theory. The fact that you are going to find patterns. You're going to find a 666 in a random group of numbers. You, you just will. If that group of numbers, even a small set group of numbers, the, the chances are, are um, it is inevitable there will be some type of pattern. Depending on the size of the group, highly likely that pattern will include a 666. We used two examples of how ignorance is built into these conspiracy theories. The death of Princess Diana, just basic ignorance about different medical systems across the world, ignorance about uh, climate change and uh, the melting polar ice caps and rising sea levels. And then we briefly looked at Ramsey theory, which I will link to articles who can explain it better than I can. But I will erase these. And there's just one quote by Walter Weiss, really just one paragraph that I want us to take apart and see how we have both ignorance and a misunderstanding of the Ramsey theory built into this statement. And I'm going to be honest, both for time and for sanity, I didn't watch a lot of him to get to this quote, I watched about five minutes and picked the first paragraph he said that contained any actual information. It's not that I haven't watched him, I grew up on him. I've seen, I think, his entire Total Onslaught series. Um, but I'm just going to take this one paragraph because it was the first thing I came across in his video. But it gives an example of his whole mindset. And I know that this is an example of his whole mindset because he still continues to promote the Total Onslaught series. And I remember keenly the way um, he built his arguments in the Total Onslaught. Walter Weiss, quoting him. He says, look at some false flags, some distractions. The media tells us who is in control and who is the troublemaker? Who is the, me the media telling you the troublemaker is? It's saying the terrorists in the Middle East. So he's framing this around um, terrorism, 9-11. Um, who has ever been to the Middle East? Who has ever seen those countries? So you'll remember we actually referred to this quote a couple of weeks ago when we spoke about um, Sunni, Shias, Iran, Saudi Arabia. Who has ever seen those countries? Who has ever travelled through Syria? I travelled through Syria from the south to the north and from the north to the south before it was destroyed. So before the Civil War. And before it was destroyed, I thought it was already destroyed. It was like going back into the Middle Ages. People on donkeys riding around with long beards. Speaking now with sarcasm. They were so frightening I thought the whole world would quake in fear just looking at them. So that he's being sarcastic. They don't look frightening to him. Ridiculous. And if you look at their society and how they live, there must be something else that must be creating that false flag. So what is he going to do? He's going to take you to come and look at Syria. Now he's going to take you hundreds of thousands, at least thousands of kilometres away from where the actual issues were. They weren't in Syria. They were in Saudi Arabia and Pakistan and Afghanistan. Not in Syria. Syria is Shia. Hoping we could remember that study. So he's also going to take you far away from the actual scene of where terrorism was, uh, was fomented. But what is he doing? He's saying, why is it that when you go to Syria, you see People on donkeys riding around with long beards who don't look fearful. How come you see that when you go to Syria? And you're not seeing these terrorists that the media is telling you exist there. So it's the, why is it? And now he's got to introduce the, could it be? Could it be that these Syrian 
terrorists are a false flag for some, someone else that is controlling behind the scenes and was behind 9-11 uh, and, and these attacks. So first of all, I already tried in that other presentation to deal with the ignorance that's inbuilt. And it becomes really easy once you start going into that history, and we did. We showed Iran, it's Shia, Saudi Arabia is Sunni. They are both church state models. We used a parable example as if Shia was Catholic and Saudi Arabia Sunni was Protestant. The reason we labelled one Catholic, one Protestant is because one believes in, um, in taking care of sacred sites and images. Essentially, the Sunnis see the Shias as idolaters, the same way a Protestant would look at an image of Mary and uh, all that Catholic regalia and call it idolatry. What you have is two church-state governments where the church controls the state. You go back to the Middle Ages, that's what you had. So as you can imagine, it's like in there they have this same problem as we saw in the 1260 where you have a, a Catholic run country and a Protestant run country and in the end all you get is a lot of bloodshed. We showed how that fomented in the 1979 to 89 Afghanistan war when over here in Afghanistan you had it bordering Pakistan and how Saudi Arabia sent their radical clerics to create hundreds of religious schools to export Wahhabism. It's a radical um, sect of Sunnism that they have made go mainstream through these different efforts and it's all to give legitimacy to their right to rule the throne and the sacred Muslim is sites of Islam, Mecca and Medina that exist in Saudi Arabia. So to give themselves legitimacy, they have to export their sect of Islam. They saw their opportunity in the Afghanistan war and it spread through Pakistan and that is what became in Pakistan in that uh, one town that we said that became like the birthplace of all of this. You had the father of jihad, the founder of jihad, call over Osama bin Laden, and they became the two co-creators of Al-Qaeda. The same town, same time period, the men, uh, names that we don't know very well, but, came, but that the men that became the early founders of ISIS, before they called it ISIS, those terrorist organisations springing up as this radical version of Islam was particularly um, fomented by primarily Saudi Arabia. Iran, they have their own. They have, um, what's it called? Uh, Hezbollah. They have Hezbollah. That is essentially a Shiite um, radical, really quite a terrorist organisation. But you would never see Hezbollah, if you were to put Hezbollah and ISIS in one room, they would kill each other, literally. They, they, they are not in agreement because one is Shia and one is Sunni. And it's this Sunni branch of, of, that created Al-Qaeda, Al it led to ISIS. That's why you find uh, the, the vast majority of the terrorists at 9-11 were Saudi Arabian. It's come out of here and what Walter Weith has done is said, I went to Syria. I travelled around and stared at the people and they didn't look scary, they didn't look like terrorists who would have hit at 9-11. First of all, wrong country. Second of all, Shia, not Sunni. And last of all, I don't want to get into who he is as a person. This isn't a comment about him, this is a comment about this statement. This statement is racist. It's racist regarding how it sees what the Middle East is capable of. How much of modern Western society we owe to the Middle East, right down to the mathematics we were discussing before. How much do we owe to, to the Asian regions? What did they give us? So it, it's, it's also, I, at the statement, don't mean to comment on the man, the statement is racist. 
um, essentially saying they wouldn't be capable of terrorism. But leaving racism to one side, although it is part of our discussion, it's, his whole methodology is particularly based on ignorance. And again, he uses questions. Why is it that I went to Syria and I didn't see people who looked scary? And now he's going to bring in the could it be? And again, he doesn't just use questions, he also uses sarcasm. And it's so hard when someone teaches with questions and then with sarcasm to actually get into the intent of, of what their point is. So he, he's continuing with the sarcasm now. He says, no, it's the Zionists that are in control. The bankers, the money men, the Rothschilds and all of these, they're in control. He says that kind of with sarcasm. Have you heard of all of these? Here is an interesting one. Then he's going to quote from the Jewish Encyclopedia that describes the Rothschild family as the guardians of the papal treasure. Rothschilds is a German word meaning red shield. Who were the ones who wore red shields in war? The Roman army. This is the Roman army. These are the front Jews. They are papal Jews. Papal people in disguise. Where is Rome leading us to? So he's bringing in these two, um, these two parts of what would for form a conspiracy theory. He's using ignorance because this actual statement is so incredibly ignorant. He's bringing in the Ramsey theory, which is... Um, Essentially, that in any set of data, you're going to see something that, that looks like a pattern. And he's moulding them two together. And again, behind what he's saying, although you can't pin it because of, the, because of the sarcasm and the questions, is still racism. He is saying that the Jews are in control. He just wants to get out of it by saying, they're not, they're not your average Jews. These are papal Jews. These are Zionists and Jews who are being controlled by the Pope. So he's still spreading this anti-Semitic Zionist message that is still racist. But he can back out of that by saying, these are, it's not their fault. These Jews are controlled by others behind the scenes. And he's giving evidence for it. Rothschild is a German word meaning red shield. Why is it? that their name means red shield. And if you look over here, who wore red shield in war? The Roman army. This is the Roman army. So he's going to take you from a why is it to a could, have be, could it be to a conspiracy theory that's actually completely, completely illogical. Based on a name, I'm going to quote from Spectrum magazine. Please, no one stone me from that. This is a Spectrum magazine, uh, magazine article on Walter Vyth. I just want to take one point they, they make. Is it really just a coincidence that Vyth is the Germanized name for Vitus, who was one of the 14 holy helpers of the Roman Catholic Church and who also happens to be the patron saint of actors? To repeat that. Is it just, I'm going to mute all, if we can all please um, st st uh, try and stay muted for, for the audio. Is it really just a coincidence that Weith is the Germanized v uh, name for Vitus, who was one of the 14 holy hem helpers of the Roman Catholic Church and who also happens to be the patron saint of actors? So you, if I was to use Walter Weith's methodology, I would say, why is it? His name was one of 14 holy helpers of the Roman Catholic Church and who also happens to be the patron saint of actors. Could it be that he's an actor controlled by the Pope of Rome as one of their 14 holy helpers? No. A Spectrum magazine says the same answer is no, it is just a coincidence. Walter Weith is not a, a, an actor acting on behalf of the Roman Catholic Church. But if you were to use his methodology, that's the type of conclusion you would have to come to.
So back to what he has said here. I'm going to erase this. All right, I'll keep it up for now. He says the Zionists, they are in control. The bankers, the money men, the Rothschilds. He claims to not believe that, but what he's saying is that they are in control, but behind the Rothschilds, the bankers and the Zionists is the Pope. And what do they all have in common? Zionists refers to, to Jews. The Rothschilds were a Jewish family. Bankers were associated with Jews. This is all the Jews. So this is all the Jews that he's referring to. And he says they're front Jews, they're papal Jews. The Rothschilds were the Roman army. And he's going to take you to a quote to prove that. And he takes you to the Jewish encyclopedia that describes the Rothschilds as the guardians of the papal treasure. So I want us to actually look into the Rothschilds just briefly. The first thing I noticed, but he didn't, he, he really tried to skip over that quickly, is this Jewish encyclopedia that he's quoting from was the 1906 Jewish encyclopedia. So just so we know, that's 114 years ago that they were described as the guardians of the papal treasure. And this video, I believe it was from 2018. So it's not going back even a decade or so. This is recent. And he takes into no account the fact that this Jewish encyclopedia is well over 100 years old. So the Rothschilds were a wealthy banking Jewish family in the 1800s. Some of their descendants spread around the globe and many are wealthy. But just to put that in context today, why I walked in front of the camera if I went fuzzy. Just to put that in context today, the Rothschild alive today in 2020. The richest Rothschild alive today is worth $1.7 billion. So this is Benjamin Rothschild. This is today in 2020. Benjamin Rothschild, he's worth $1.7 billion uh, as documented by Forbes' wealthiest people alive. That may sound significant um, and impressive, but that is number 1,121 in the list of wealthiest people alive. So the wealthiest Rothschild alive today is the 1,000th 121 richest person on earth. When you consider that this is supposed to be the wealthy family that controls the elite behind the scenes in this satanic deep state, that starts to sound crazy. The wealthiest, the 1,121st richest person alive. The closest thing to any Rothschild family business that relates to the Rothschilds as a family is the Rothschilds Group Investment Banking Company whose annual profit is $70 million. The largest company in the world, Walmart, its annual profits of $120 billion annually is almost 2,000 times as much. So when you talk about the money the Rothschilds have today, we're not talking about of any type of scale like what you would have seen back uh, 100, 150 years ago. Central, for an, another point, central banks are state institutions and have nothing to do with any Rothschilds. Central banks are run by states, not by billionaires. So where did these conspiracy theories about the Rothschilds come from? The Rothschilds family were Jewish. It is an act, aspect of anti-Semitism, the belief that Jews are powerful behind the scenes manipulators of global events. So what happened is you're going back hundreds of years and there was a, if you were to go back hundreds of years, you would see that anti-Semitism was just everywhere. Jews were only allowed to live uh, in ghettos. If I can try and find... Uh, Jews... 
were forbidden in some places from um, owning any property. So you had, if I was to take a country, that this country has a group of Jews and it has a group of Christians and the Jewish people are forbidden from owning any property. They're segregated and forced to live in ghettos. The Christians, because of their belief in, um, in certain passages of scripture, believe that they cannot lend any money. They don't believe that, that it's, it's right for a Christian to lend money to anyone because they believe that's anti-biblical. So Christians don't become active in the banking system because of their Christian beliefs about lending money. The Jews don't hold to that same belief. They don't read scripture and say that money should not be lent. So you have a society which is completely anti-Semitic where the Jews are segregated, they're not allowed to own property, they're, they're forced to live in ghettos, but where they're also needed, and they're needed for the financial system to work because Christians cannot loan money to, to, to each other. They don't believe in lending back then, but the Jews do. So if a Christian needs to borrow money, where do you go? You could only go to a Jew. So the Jews became very prevalent in the banking system. It's not because they had some deep agenda. It was because the only, it was one of the few things they could do to earn a livelihood. And it was because of that anti-Semitism that segregated them, while also the Christians needed them uh, to finance their businesses. So you ha it was really that the, the prevalence of Jews within banking was built because of that system, that difference in religious belief that related to lending. Also, Jews recognised that as they lived in anti-Semitic environments, as they were persecuted, that the more highly educated their children were, the more their children were likely to hold on to their Jewish faith. So they became very um, conscious of education and they would do everything they could to get their children good educations. So out of this desire to keep the Jewish faith alive and to spread it from generation to generation, you have two things emerge. First of all, they became very highly educated despite the anti-Semitism. And second of all, they became very prevalent in the banking system dis despite the anti-Semitism because of the different beliefs in money lending. So it is true that Jews were, were both wealthy, highly educated in some areas, the ones that weren't still stuck in the ghettos in the system, and they were also prevalent in the banking system. That's something that is logical. Where it goes is somewhere illogical. The Rothschilds were just one of those families. They lived in the ghettos, they became involved in money lending because only the Jews could, uh, and they, they um, built themselves up uh, into, into, um, into the banking world and they did become extremely wealthy. I think I referred to a conspiracy theory back um, when I read it was actually uh, by a, a it's a, a, a Russian-led um, conspiracy theory journal that spoke about the Rothschilds and the Jews or, or the Jews or Zionists as being behind the 9-11 attacks. It's the exact same thing Walter Weith is all, he's talking about terrorism, 9-11 and then Zionists and, and the Catholic Church and he's really wrapping it all into quite a, a tight bundle. So this created anti-Semitism right back from around the, the late 1800s. It was particularly prevalent in the Catholic Church. When we've done the studies on, um, on the, the counterfeit of this, the counterfeit of modern Israel, where we went back and looked at modern Babylon and we saw Hitler's Pope, the way the Catholic Church responded to World War II as, as Satan was trying to resurrect this modern Babylon. Um, this counterfeit of modern Israel. We saw that within the Catholic Church, just generally through the, through the society, this anti-Semitism was very prevalent. And because of this, partly because of this anti-Semitism, largely because of it, um, you did have Jews become involved in revolutions. So if you're a persecuted minority and you're oppressed for a, a great length of time, what, what's going to happen? 
When there's a revolution, are you going to join that revolution? Yes. So you can see that in America right now. You can see that in the French Revolution. An oppressed society that has been, has been subjugated for so long will react um, with, with, um, by forming part of this revolution. So when you had the Russian Revolution, were Jews involved in it? Yes, there were Jews that were part of the Russian Revolution. The cause is a natural one. They were oppressed and persecuted under the Tsar. But what Hitler does is he particularly takes this idea about the Jews as being wealthy, as being uh, involved in the banking system, as being involved in, uh, in the rise of communism and the Russian Revolution, and it creates an entire conspiracy theory around the Zionists. And this is what is going to develop into the Holocaust. He blamed the Jews for the loss of Germany in World War I. It was a Zionist deep state. He blamed the Jews for the Russian Revolution. Uh, and it's all behind um, this anti-Semitism. It was also rife within the Catholic Church. Really through most of society, it was quite uh, acceptable for people back then to hold on to this um, conspiracy theories and anti-Semitism. So you have something that's actually quite logical. Jews involved in the Russian Revolution. Not just Jews, but they were there. They were there because they were persecuted under the Tsar and they wanted freedom like anyone else. So the Rothschilds, they became quite wealthy in the early 1800s as they uh, worked within uh, the money lending system. Their business continued to grow. And then particularly when it comes to uh, the, Napo the Napoleonic Wars, they started lending money to different states in the Napoleonic Wars. Again, they can lend, Christians can't. As William I, Elector of Hesse, refused to join the French Supporting Confederation of the Rhine at its formation in 1806, William I is threatened by Napoleon. In Frankfurt, he asks his agent, Meyer asks Jell Rothschild to convey bonds worth £600,000 he has received from Britain to subsidise his army to safety in England. So the Rothschilds were working between William I and Napoleon and they were um, lending money uh, in, the, in those wars. The Rothschild, however, used the money for his own ends with the help of his sons, um, Nathan uh, Rothschild in London and James Rothschild in Paris. They first used the money to finance Wellington's army in Spain's war against Napoleon at advantageous terms of interest. In a notable coup in 1815, Nathan Rothschild spreads the rumour that Napoleon had won the Battle of Waterloo, causing London's stock prices to collapse. He then bought a large quantity of equities at the bottom of the market, profiting handsomely as prices rose once the truth about the Battle of Waterloo emerged. In 10 years, the Rothschilds had accumulated a fortune of 11 million pounds, and that is their money, not our money, so you can imagine interest. And they were able to then formalise a European-wide network of led uh, network of family-led financial institutions. If that sounds reasonable to you, that was the plot of a 1940 Nazi-released film titled The Rothschild, and none of that's true. What Hitler did was he took the Rothschilds and he created a film in 1940 that showed the Rothschilds stabbing William I in the back and then Napoleon in the back using both these state governments to finance a fortune or to create a fortune of 11 million pounds. How they crashed the London economy. This deep state conspiracy theory about the Rothschilds is not true. It's a plot summary of a film released by the Nazis in 1940. It was used to justify the Holocaust. So when we start talking about the Rothschilds, this conspiracy theory, there's absolutely no evidence for it. They built their finances by lending money, working through the banking system. But what Hitler turned that into is a conspiracy theory that's based on no fact. They didn't steal money from William I and then stab him in the back and then use Napoleon in the Battle of Waterloo. 
It's all just justification for, for the Holocaust. What did happen? As the Rothschilds were lending money, they weren't lending money discriminatorily. That They were lending money to whoever would take it. It's just finances. It's just work. In 1831, Cardinal Capel Capellari is elected Pope Gregory XVI. The Rothschilds were considered reliable in conservative circles in Europe because they had worked with the Austrian government to stabilise finances after the Napoleonic Wars. So they hadn't stabbed in the back William I and Napoleon. The Rothschilds are seen as reliable people to do business with. If they had have crashed the London economy, they would not have been seen as reliable with a good reputation as businessmen. People wouldn't have worked with them. But when you have a new pope in 1831, and the Vatican finances are uh, uh, in a dire straits, they're going to turn to who is the most reliable. Initially, there was resistance during the no negotiations. So this new um, papal hierarchy with a new pope, they want to work with the Rothschilds, and there's resistance, particularly from the Roman government and Monsignor Antonio Garibaldi at Paris. However, Alessandro... Tolonia, acting for the Vatican, held direct negotiations with James Rothschild and thrashed out an agreement. So the, the papacy is struggling, it's falling, it's losing its papal states. This is, um, it, this is about 43 years after, after 1798. They need to, to make some financial agreements. They turned to the Rothschilds because they have uh, a good reputation. There's resistance because a lot of Roman Catholics don't like the Catholic Church getting bailed out by a Jewish family. This did not go over well. But there is an agreement signed on the 30th of November 1831. Thus in 1832, the Rothschilds agreement to provide a loan to the Holy See for £400,000 equivalent in 2019 to £37.4 million pounds came into force. So the Rothschilds lent money to the Vatican in 1831. James Rothschild, head of the Rothschild banking family of France, became the official papal banker. His Naples-based brother, Karl Meyer von Rothschild, geographically closer to Rome, went to meet with Pope Gregory XVI in January of 1832. It was customary for Catholics to show reverence for what they regarded as the Vicar of Christ, to kiss the Pope's feet when meeting him. As a Jew, Karl Rothschild was permitted to simply kiss the ring on his hand instead. This outraged Catholics, Catholic critics at, of the deal at the time. So this was a massive scandal for Catholics. The fact that a, a Jew, Jewish family would bail out the, the Roman Catholic Church to the extent of, in today's dollars, 37 million pounds. And then the, the, that one of the heads of that family didn't kiss the Pope's feet. A second loan occurred during the pontificate of Pope Pius IX in the early 1850s with the same members of the Rothschild family. After the collapse of a short-lived revolution, uh, short-lived revolutionary Roman Republic and the restoration of the Papal States, reports of this loan led to stinging criticisms of Pope Gregory XVI in the Christian, in particular Catholic world, so particularly the Catholic world, but also through the, the Protestant world as well. Almost all of which circulated around the Jewishness of the Rothschilds. So this wasn't the fact that they were the, the papal bankers was not some hidden knowledge that Walter Weiss dug out. This was a scandal in the 1830s, 40s and 50s. The French poet Alfred de Vigny said, A Jew now reigns over the Pope and Christianity. He pays monarchs and buys nations. Ludwig Vaughan, a Jewish convert to Lutheranism and a member of the Young Germany movement, stated, a wealthy Jew kisses his hand while a poor Christian kisses the Pope's feet. So a poor Christian kisses the, Pope, the, uh, the feet of the Pope and a wealthy Jew only has to kiss his hand. 
The Rothschilds are assuredly nobler than their ancestor Judas Iscariot. He sold Christ for 30 small pieces of silver. The Rothschilds would buy him if he were for sale. Another prominent example is the mention of the loan in a sonnet by, I won't read his full name, uh, I think they just call him Belly. While Belly found the Rothschilds highly objectionable, for him the Pope was even worse as a weak man who had sold both Rome and the, and the state and was thus no longer worthy of wearing the papal robes. This was not a deep state Rothschild controlling the world conspiracy theory. They were doing their job. They lent money to William I. They worked through the Napoleonic Wars. Or they controlled some of, the finance, some of his finances. And they interacted with the Vatican. It was no secret. It was widely acceptable. Let me rem remind you, in the days when Adventism had a prophet, and is she speaking about any of this? No. If Ellen White was living through this and didn't feel the need to speak about it, to include it in any of her writings, in the dispensation she is living in, why is it somehow secret knowledge we've dug up today? Pope Gregory XVI appointed Cardinal Tosti as the new papal treasurer in July 1834. Tosti attempted to refinance the debt in more favourable terms. Because of the backlash among the Christian and Catholic community by their doing work with this Jewish banking family, Tosti, um, the, the new papal treasurer, tried to annul the agreement with the Rothschilds behind their back and to go into a deal with another banking firm in Paris because of this backlash. When he did this, one of the Rothschild, uh, one of the Rothschild heads travelled to Rome, held out his contract and said, you signed this, you can't back out of this contract. And the Catholic Church was forced by that contract to not go into an agreement with another banking firm. The Rothschilds then tried to leverage their influence within the Vatican to improve conditions for the 15,000 Jews in the Papal States. They asked the Pope to cancel the extra taxes that were levied solely on the Jews, the prohibition on taking property from the ghetto and the ban on working professionals, and that he abolished evidentiary standards that put them at a disadvantage in court cases. Their requests were declined. So they attempted to improve the lot of their disadvantaged um, Jews le living in the, the ghettos in the Papal States. Um, but none of, that was, um, none of that became possible. So when you go back and you see the work the Rothschilds did within the Vatican... Yes, going back into the 1800s through the Napoleonic Wars, through the 30s and the 50s and forward, you had the Rothschilds um, working, doing their job, also working for the Catholic Church as part of their banking system. So when you come to a Jewish encyclopedia that's written in 1906 that says the Rothschilds are the guardians of the papal treasure, as, con as much as that sounds as evidence of a conspiracy theory, it's really not. It's just historical fact. But that is historical fact that was true in 1906, not in 2020 or 2018. It was true in 1906. In 2020, how much influence does the Rothschild family have in the banking system? None. In the finances of the Vatican? None. None of that exists 120 years later. Nearly 200 years after, 190 years after that first loan was entered into. The system no longer works that way. So to use 1830s and 50s and then one sentence, one sentence from a 1906 encyclopedia to prove, to prove this satanic deep state where the Pope controls the Rothschilds, controls the Zionists, controls the terrorists. That's the model he's brought up. Pope, Zionists, Rothschilds, terrorists, 9-11. Think about the evidence that that's actually built on and there isn't any. In fact, it's built on ignorance, 
Why is it that they would be listed in a 1906 um, encyclopedia as being the guardians of papal treasure? Could it be that, there is, uh, that they have a relationship to the Pope 114 years later? Could it be that this Pope controls the Zionists and that's a reason for 9-11, this satanic Illuminati deep state? Because it can't be here, because it couldn't be, why is it that Syria is so apparently backward um, and not intimidating, that terrorists can't arrive, uh, arise from the Middle East because I walked through Syria and I didn't see any? Can you see that, how that methodology is built up? But it's built up the same way Mary Stuart Ralph builds up hers. Can you see the 666, the lyrics from the Coca-Cola um, advertising campaign? This Beatles song, the lyrics from the Beatles song, she uses the same methodology to come to the same satanic deep state conclusions. And they continue today. You see conspiracy theories surround George Soros. George Soros, he's a wealthy man today, he's a billionaire. And the Republican Party, far right, again, socially conservative Protestantism, they were part of this all the way through. As much as they need Israel, they need Israel where there's going to be 144,000 convert to Christianity. They can't have an Israel that's going to... Um, that's going to stay Jews. They don't, support, they, don't, they, they don't support Jews. They need the Jewish state to bring about the thousand years, the, the coming of, the, uh, of Jerusalem, and then uh, 144,000 of those Jews will convert, is what they believe. So just to close, we've just taken one quote by Walter Weiss, just 30 seconds of that message. And it's, it's really just one example of what his entire message is built upon. And, and it's the same thing that we see this socially conservative branch of, Protestant, of Protestantism has done since 1798, when he speaks about the Bavarian Illuminati and Alexander Hamilton and uh, Thomas Jefferson. It's that, why is it, could it be it's the Bavarian Illuminati? How they use this literal to literal interpretation, the enforcement of morality, slavery, Sunday laws in the 1888 history, justifying segregation. And it's what we're seeing today when we see, why is it that there are coronavirus cases where a 5G network poll was just put up? Why is it, could it be that there's a correlation and that equals causation. Because the 5G networks went online and the coronavirus came, they correlate, therefore there's causation. One caused the other. 5G caused the coronavirus. You start getting into a problem with that the minute you bring some information to that. For example, why is Iran so hard hit by the coronavirus? Even while they try and suppress it and hide it, Iran has no 5G network. The countries, many countries that are suffering under the coronavirus, that are digging mass graves, have no 5G network. But because we're looking for an explanation and we see this correlation, we believe that there's causation. This is what happens to the most conspiracy theories around vaccines. Saying correlation equals causation within the few, first few years of a child's life. It's this type of ignorance where we're all ignorant to some degree about many topics. That's why we research. That's why we have to trust experts in their fields. You have this Ramsey theory that we briefly discussed. We showed how it works through conservative Protestantism and we're going to come back next week and look at conservative Protestantism. Socially conservative Protest Protestantism as they stand up and back the Trump administration and how they, they have uh, continued with that same methodology. But their methodology always comes back to the same thing. There's a satanic deep state and the solution is to overthrow that satanic deep state 
and bring about a Christian nation. So I just want to finish. I know I'm, I know I've gone for a while. I just want to finish on one point. Uh, I'll put it over here because a sister asked this in the question time last week. And it was a good question. I just want to um, address it. The question went something like this. How do we know what to believe of, of the Adventism that we've grown up with? All that we've heard from Walter Weith, from conservative Adventism, how do we know what to believe? I just want to do something, if you can work with me for a moment. We understand the idea of a one world government. We get that from passages of Daniel and Revelation, particularly Revelation. And we talk about the ten kings. So we all can believe in a one world government. This core idea of a one world government, I don't mean to shake that. It's behind what Walter Weiss will teach. It's but what is what is behind I will teach. Walter Weiss and I both believe in one world government. But consider the following. What he's going to do is the exact same thing that socially conservative Protestant faction is doing. One world government. We understand that through the Ten Kings, which, as we showed before, um, that was all taught in the 1980s as being this confederation of nations, these ten nations, and it becomes globalism, both for Protestants and conservative Adventists. Globalism and the UN. Why is Trump so antagonistic towards globalism and the UN? Because his base is socially conservative Protestants and they have a belief system that is antagonistic to globalism and the UN. So you automatically know what side you're on. Ten Kings, globalism and the UN. Behind this all, it's a satanic deep state. So we'll photograph this afterwards and put it on the group. Satanic deep state. Within this deep state, there are these secret societies. And we listed a few. The Rothschilds, who are now at their most wealthiest, the 1,121st richest men on the Forbes list. Rothschilds, Illuminati, George Soros, Bill Gates, all of that faction. They tie this with growing immorality. One of the evidences is this growing immorality. That's why they'll take you to songs, lyrics from, from bands like the Beatles, etc. And you can know all this. None of this is obvious to you. None of this is in the open. You can only know this through secret knowledge. Secret knowledge handed from part person to person or through observing hand signals or numbers or logos or through these subtle um, evidences that you'll find flashed. So you have to look for these evidences through things like 666, song lyrics, logos, etc. This was behind Mary Stuart Ralph. It's exactly what Walter Weith do, does. So this is one side. All believing this, the danger is this one world government. It's what's coming. We also believe in this one world government. We don't go to Revelation and, and, and uh, redefine it to that extent. But consider this. We believe in the Ten Kings. But we're not going to approach it through conspiracy theories. This is going to be approached through conspiracies. This is going to be approached through parables. So where do you find ten? Ten of something. A group of ten. The tribes of Israel. You have the two and the ten. So when you have the ten tribes, how are they structured? You have ten but does each one of those ten have autonomy? No. You have one 
control the other nine. One control the other nine is a dictatorship. So one is a dictator over the nine. So you're going to go straight to a parable to know what those ten kings look like. Ancient Israel will give you that, the ten. And what we can understand through uh, other parables, this is one. That's just one. You can go to a second. You can go to 1989 history and see it again. But this one world government, instead of being a deep state where they're all friends, what you see is the United States control the UN as a dictatorship. What we call unilateralism. This requires the coming together of republicanism and protestantism. Church plus state. And you can prove that. You can see that even just through straight Ellen White quotes. What protestantism is going to do. Is protestantism going to work with the UN to bring about a Sunday law? No. Protestantism hates the UN because they see that confederacy and globalism as being what is going to bring about the Antichrist. Republicanism, Protestantism, church and state, we're going to use parables. We can use multiple parables if I list them down here. It's the one and the nine tribes, one over the other. Another parable is what happened in 1989 as we went from two superpowers to one superpower and the Gulf War. That's been demonstrated in other videos. Another witness, again, all using parables. World War I plus World War II equals World War III. So, World War I, Kaiser Wilhelm plus Adolf Hitler equals Donald Trump. Now, was Adolf Hitler or Kaiser Wilhelm working with a deep state where all the nations were friends behind the scenes? No. If Hitler would have won World War II, what would you have? You would have a one world government. There would be other governments. It's a too large territory to control himself. But they are subjected under his leadership. It would be as it was with the tribes, a dictator controlling the others. So World War I, World War II equals World War III. Dictatorship, dictatorship, dictatorship. So these are all parables that will give us a, a, a witness for what this would have looked like. So while we all can believe in the idea of a one world government, what that looks like will take you down very different roads. And the conclusion of that, why we've come to a, a point in 2016 where it splits not just Adventism, but also Protestantism, is because now it's visible. If you believe the one world government looks like this, who is Trump to you? If this is your one world government, globalism, the UN, satanic deep states, spreading immorality that you can see through these secret signs, who is Trump to you? Trump is the hero. Trump is the Cyrus. He's the anointed to save you. If you believe in this, that this is what the one world government is based, uh, is built upon, not on conspiracy theories, but using parable teaching, that we have given multiple, multiple witnesses that each stand alone. World War II stands alone, but we have scriptural evidences and historical evidences, then Trump becomes what? Trump becomes the dictator. And everyone who goes down this line of thought will have the wrong understanding about the king, the kingdom and the external events that tell us what is happening and what is going to happen to the glorious land. So Adventism does not understand the external events. They don't see the des destruction of Jerusalem that's coming because they're on this side with Walter Weith, using the methodology and coming to the same core 
principled conclusions as conservative Protestantism. This side, this is the message of John and Christ in modern Israel that we're learning through parables that are designed to save us from this, to warn us about what's about to happen. And when the Sunday law of our dispensation passes, we won't be over here seeing Trump as the anointed Cyrus, the hero that's to save us from the one world government. We'll see that he is the one world government. So while we have, it, it can seem that we can come to many of the same conclusions um, someone was afraid last week that I was saying we shouldn't keep the Sabbath anymore and that was because I'd worded a sentence badly. I'm not saying that. We have the same conclusions but what it looks like in reality can decide what side at the Sunday law you stand on. That's the message that we're trying to bring to, to Adventism, will bring to Adventism and the danger is, is that just like ancient Israel had the mindset of the pagan nations that led them to expect the wrong external events, Adventism has the mindset of socially conservative Protestantism. So next week we're going to have another look at socially conservative Protestantism today under the Trump administration and what they're actually doing right now. Uh, and we'll review some of this. Please send in your questions. Um, Please join the, 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 uh, the media broadcast if you haven't already. And also, if there's some way that you can send in your questions about what we're discussing, because I can see a danger if we move too quickly uh, and certain things aren't, um, aren't understood. So we'll close with a prayer, if you would kneel with me. Dear Father in heaven, thank you for our blessings. Thank you that you have given us your parable teaching, that we can... Uh, identify correctly that the history that we're walking through, each one of us, Lord, comes from a background of these um, theories, of these uh, conspiracy theories, whichever one they are, that there are very few of us who haven't been part of that uh, mindset. I pray that you will help us as we uh, try to discern truth from error, as we try to put in practice the methodology that you've given us, I pray, Lord, that we, will be, uh, that we will be conscious of the need to change even our most cherished, um, cherished belief systems. But as we do that, Lord, may we understand your character better, which is your true design of this message. May we understand how you operate, how you do nothing without telling your people, not through secret handshakes, Lord, but you teach us through your design methodology, parable teaching. I pray that you will um, bring us closer into unity uh, as brothers and sisters in this message. Lord, I know that we are, um, all have different questions, but I pray, Lord, that we will look at these things with love and humility, recognising um, uh, the changes that you're requiring your people to make and that we might, uh, we might assist each other hand to hand um, through this difficult time. And that, Lord, we know that, that the, final, um, the final result of this movement of, of priests, Lord, is for us not to hold this information to ourselves, but to be able to warn a church that is dangerously far down a wrong path. I pray, Lord, that you will equip us to this end. In Jesus' name, amen.